Hello and welcome to our podcast summary of activities supporting consistent application covering January to March 2020. I'm Petrina Buchanan, a member of the ISB's technical staff, and I'm here today with Sue Lloyd, Vice Chair of the Board and Chair of the Interpretations Committee. And we're actually recording this podcast remotely, so we hope it works OK and we hope that everyone listening as well. So I'm going to start with the two Interpretations Committee meetings that took place in January and March. At those meetings, the committees discussed five topics. And I'm going to start, Sue, by asking you about the final agenda decisions published on the definition of a lease, on training costs and on hyperinflationary foreign operations. OK, thanks, Petrina. So firstly, the definition of a lease. Uh, so this was at the January Interpretation Committee meeting and the committee finalised an agenda decision on the definition of a lease and the particular question that the committee received and that we talked about was a shipping contract and it was one in which almost all of the relevant decisions about the use of a ship had been predetermined in the contract. So the contract specified the quantity and the type of goods to be transported, the destination and the overall number of voyages over the five year term of the contract. But the customer retained the right to decide upon the starting port for each voyage. So the submission asked whether the customer had the right to direct the use of the ship if it retains some decision making rights, but only a small piece with all of the other decisions being predetermined. And the committee concluded that yes, in that situation, the customer has the right to direct the use of the ship. So in the contract submitted, um, the customer's right to decide upon the starting point for each voyage is a relevant decision about how and for what purpose the ship is used. So this agenda decision really explains pretty well, I think, how to think about decision making rights when assessing whether a contract contains a lease. So it explains that predetermined rights define the scope of the customer's right of use, but generally are not considered in this assessment. Instead, a company needs to focus on the decisions that the customer can make during the contract term and whether those rights give the customer the ability to influence the economic benefits that it will derive from the use of the asset. And it's really that last bit that's the critical piece of the agenda decision. So we looked at a specific fact pattern, but the key thing we were focusing on was if the customer has the ability to influence the economic benefits that it will derive from the use of the asset. That is enough decision making to meet the, less, the lease definition. So now moving on to the March Interpretations Committee meeting and uh, training costs to fulfil a contract. And so this is uh, an IFRS 15 question. So the committee finalised an agenda decision on training costs that were incurred to fulfil a contract with a customer. So in the example, the, the question was about a revenue contract that a company signs with a customer to, for example, provide online and telephone support for the customer's equipment. And to provide that service to the customer, the company incurs costs to train its employees to understand how the customer's equipment works and the company can recharge those training costs to the customer. So when the company incurs the training costs and credits cash, basically does it debit an asset or is the debit an expense? The committee concluded that the debit is an expense and that the company recognises the costs as an expense when they're incurred. And these training costs are within the scope of IES 38. And paragraph 69 of IES 38 requires expenditure on training activities to be recognised as an expense when they're incurred. Now, importantly, the committee discussed whether the company's right to recharge the costs to the customer has any influence on the outcome, and, in, and it concluded that it didn't. Now, people responding to the tentative agenda decision said that clarifying that point was important. So the agenda decision notes specifically that the company's right to recharge the customer doesn't affect the conclusion in the agenda decision. Now, last than, uh, but not least, moving on to another um, discussion that we had at the March meeting, and this is on hyperinflationary foreign operations. So we had three questions submitted about this, which resulted in three agenda decisions. 
And as a reminder, the question arose as a consequence of Argentina becoming a hyperinflationary economy from the middle of 2018. So these questions arise when, for example, a parent prepares consolidated financial statements in, say, euros, and to prepare those consolidated financial statements, they need to translate the results and the financial position of an Argentinian subsidiary that has a hyperinflationary functional currency. So the first question the committee was asked was about the presentation of differences that result from firstly restating the financial statements of the Argentinian subsidiary applying IES 29, and then as a second step, translating those restated financial statements into the group presentation currency applying IES 21. And for this question, the committee concluded that applying IES 21, exchange differences are presented in other comprehensive income or OCI, and they are not recognised directly in equity. But a company needs to determine whether the entire difference that results from applying IES 29 and IES 21 meets the definition of an exchange difference or only a piece of that difference. The second question asked was about exchange differences when the Argentinian subsidiary first becomes hyperinflationary. So until 2018, a parent would have presented exchange differences relating to its Argentinian subsidiary in OCI. And the question asked is whether the parent reclassifies those pre-hyperinflation exchange differences to a different component of equity when it first applies IES 29. And you might ask, why does it even matter? Well, it matters if you subsequently dispose of that subsidiary, because if the amount is um, included within other comprehensive income, it's reclassified to profit or loss on disposal of the subsidiary, so it would affect the gain or loss on disposal, whereas if it wasn't, if it was in a different part of equity, it wouldn't be reclassified in that way. So it, it can matter a lot for future accounting. Now, the committee concluded that the parent doesn't reclassify the pre-hyperinflation exchange differences to a separate component of equity. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean there'll be no change to the exchange differences that are in accumulated OCI. When an entity, the parent, first applies IES 29, they might re-measure those exchange differences, but the entire amount that's there is not reclassified to a separate component of equity. And the final question um, on the hyperinflationary front was um, relating to the presentation of comparative amounts when the um, Argentinian subsidiary first becomes hyperinflationary. And on this one, we identified very little diversity in reporting. Companies generally don't restate the comparative amounts. And the committee really is only meant to um, address issues that have a widespread effect because it didn't have a widespread effect. The required accounting isn't set out in the agenda decision. Great, um, thank you very much Sue. So with that I'm now going to move on to the two topics where the committee published tentative agenda decisions. Now in these two topics I'll, I'll be honest and tell you that Sue and I drew straws um, on first of all who would get to talk about deferred tax um, and who would get to talk about sale and leaseback accounting. So without actually commenting on who drew the short straw, um, <laughs> I'll only say that I got the ever popular topic and submissions of deferred tax. So, so the particular deferred tax question submitted was actually about whether to recognise deferred tax or not. Um, and the question related to, again, consolidated financial statements and whether an entity in its consolidated financial statements recognises deferred tax related to undistributed profits of a subsidiary. And we understand that this question came to the committee because it's arisen in particular in some Eastern European countries, given how distributions of profits are taxed in those countries. So when the fact pattern submitted um, in the jurisdictions where the entity and its subsidiary operate, profits are taxable only when distributed. So no income tax is payable until profits are distributed. Um, and those profit distributions are taxed only once. And the fact pattern submitted also explained that the undistributed profits of the subsidiary give rise to a taxable temporary difference for the entity related to that investment in the subsidiary. 
So in responding to the question about whether deferred tax is recognised, the committee concluded that the entity does recognise a deferred tax liability for that taxable temporary difference, and it measures it using the distributed tax rate. And so why? Well, it does so because paragraph 39 of IS 12 requires the recognition of a deferred tax liability for all taxable temporary differences associated with investments in subsidiaries. Now, and even though paragraph 29 includes an exemption from recognising deferred tax in the particular fact pattern submitted to the committee, the entity had actually determined already that the conditions to apply that recognition exemption in paragraph 39 were not satisfied. So, so the entity had already decided the exemption doesn't apply to me um, and therefore deferred tax needed to be recognised. Um, and in the particular situation, the reason that the conditions to apply the exemption were not satisfied is because the entity expected the subsidiary to distribute those undistributed profits in the foreseeable future. So the tentative agenda decision explains recognition um, and it also goes on to explain why the entity measures the deferred tax liability using the distributed tax rate and also therefore why the requirements in paragraphs 52a and 57a of IS 12 are not applicable in that particular case. Now, the second tentative agenda decision relates to one of my favourite topics, um, which is sale and leaseback transactions. And in this case, specifically, the question was on a sale and leaseback transaction that includes leaseback payments that are variable based on future sales from use of the leased asset. So maybe to make it real, um, picture a retailer that owns a retail store and who sells the store and leases it back for five years. Now the buyer less or in this case pays the retailer 1.8 million upfront for the asset, which actually represents the fair value of the store. And then over the five year lease term, the seller lessee will pay to the buyer less or a percentage of its sales from the store as consideration for its right to use the store. So ordinarily, these payments that are variable based on future sales from the store would not meet IFRS 16's definition of lease payments. So the question submitted asked two things. It first of all asked about the seller lessee's accounting at the date of the sale and leaseback transaction and specifically how the seller lessee measured the right of use asset arising from the leaseback. Then importantly linked again to the seller lessee's accounting at the date of the sale and leaseback transaction, it asked, well, how, first of all, yeah, how do I measure the right of use asset, but how then do I also measure any gain or loss arising on the transaction? And specifically, could the, the right of use asset be measured at zero because all of these payments are variable based on future sales? So, so what did the committee say here? This was, I think, a really interesting question, at least to a geek like me. And the question's being asked for a pretty simple reason, because the leaseback payments wouldn't be included in the measurement of the lease liability and the right of use asset if this was a standalone lease and not part of a sale and leaseback transaction. But because it's a sale and leaseback transaction, there are specific requirements in IFRS 16 that apply and those requirements mean that the right of use asset and the lease liability that arise from the leaseback are measured differently from what they would be if it was just a standalone lease. And this wasn't an accident. This was very much the board's intention when it developed the sale and leaseback requirements. And that's evident in the very specific accounting that's set out for sale and leasebacks and in the related discussion and the basis for conclusions. Trying to put it in non-technical language, the board wanted the measurement of the gain or loss recognised on the transaction to reflect just the part of the asset that was really sold to the purchaser and for no gain or loss to be recognised in respect of the piece of the asset that the seller continues to use. And so there's specific requirements, as I said, and these are set out in paragraphs 98 to 103 of IFRS 16. And in particular, the requirement that the committee was focusing on for the question we got was, is um, addressed in paragraph 100A of IFRS 16. 
So what does paragraph 100A say? So let's take the example that um, Petrina spelt out, where the seller lessee receives 1.8 million for selling the store, and that's its fair value. And let's assume that the store had a carrying amount of 1 million immediately before it was sold. So if the store was just sold and there was no lease back, the seller lessee would recognize a gain on sale of 800,000 but in this case, there's a five-year lease back, and that makes a difference to the gain calculation. So what paragraph 100A tells you, firstly, is how you have to measure the right-of-use asset in this situation. And the right-of-use asset is required to be recognised based on the proportion of the previous carrying amount of the store that relates to the right-of-use that's retained by the seller lessee. So even though all the rentals in our fact pattern are variable based on sales, the right of use asset can't be measured at zero, as it would if it were a standalone lease. It has to be measured at the proportion of the previous carrying amount of 1 million that relates to the five-year right of use that's been retained by the seller lessee. Secondly, paragraph 100A says that as a consequence, the gain recognised represents only the amount of the gain that relates to the rights transferred to the buyer lessor. So in our example, this means that the seller lessee won't recognise the full gain of 800,000, but something less that represents the rights that it's actually transferred to the buyer lessor. Now, if you've lost the point or the will to live at this point, I can understand that. I think this is really only understandable when you see a complete example and importantly, when you see all of the debits and credits and you can get your calculator out. That at least helped me. And so to make it understandable, the tentative agenda decision does something which is relatively unusual. It includes a worked illustrative example that sets out the debits and the credits at the date of the transaction. And what that worked example shows is that the seller lessee will recognise both the right of use asset and a lease liability at the date of the transaction, even if all the lease back payments are variable and don't depend on an index or rate. Now, that was a question that we got, but when we discussed this, the committee identified a second piece of the transaction, which is how do you subsequently measure this lease liability that arises from such a sale and lease back transaction? Now, on this point, the staff paper, if you go and look at that, set out one way that the staff thought could be used to apply IFRS 16 in this case. But the committee uh, decided that the requirements are not as complete as they might be and they could be improved. So the committee has recommended that the board undertake narrow scope standard setting to amend IFRS 16 to specifically address the subsequent measurement of this type of lease liability for a sale and leaseback transaction. Thank you, Sue. And just to let listeners know, we would expect the board to discuss whether to undertake narrow scope standard setting with respect to the subsequent measurement of the lease liability at its April board meeting. Now, just a quick reminder that the committee's conclusions on both the sale and leaseback transaction and deferred tax related to an investment in a subsidiary are both tentative and are now out for comment for 60 days until the 13th of May. So as ever, we encourage you to comment on those if they are of interest to you. And of course, I'll also just mention the reason that the committee decided to publish tentative agenda decisions on both those topics is because it concluded that standard setting is not needed. Um, and that's because in the committee's view, the principles and requirements in the standards provide an adequate basis to determine the required accounting. And so in asking for comments on the tentative agenda decisions, we are asking respondents to consider two things. First of all, whether you agree with the committee's conclusion that standard setting isn't needed, and secondly, whether you agree that with the technical analysis in the tentative agenda decision. So finally, other than the committee meetings, um, I'll just highlight a couple of um, other pieces of information in the context of our activities to support a consistent application. And these are, are very much linked to the current COVID-19 situation. First of all, I'll just highlight that the publication of a number of final narrow scope amendments uh, very much undertaken to support consistent application um, have been delayed from March and April um, and instead will all be published together in May 2020. So those relate to IS 16, 
proceeds before intended use. They relate to annual improvements. Uh, they relate to a narrow amendment to IFRS 3. Um, and also they relate to IS 37 and onerous contracts. So all of those narrow scope amendments will be um, published together in May. And this is really to facilitate post-publication procedures by our stakeholders in the current environment. And I guess one other thing to add from my side, um, because it relates to IFRS 9, so I can't resist. Last week, we put out a document that comments on the application of the expected credit loss requirements in IFRS 9 in the current difficult environment we're all facing with um, COVID-19. And we hope that this... Um, extra information will help support the robust and consistent application of IFRS 9 in what's a very uncertain environment for making estimates. So with that, uh, that brings our podcast to a close. Um, thank you, Sue. Um, thank you all for listening. We hope you find it useful. And please email communications at ifrs.org if you have any suggestions for improvement. So take care. Thank you. And goodbye.